Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, and welcome to our second learning session on um, our disability learning series. I'm happy to see familiar faces who were present in our last learning session last Friday. And happy to see that there are new people who are able to join us this afternoon. We also want to say hello to our um, friends across Asia and our partners across different parts of the Philippines. Before I continue, I just remembered. Um, hello, I'm Jen from the ASEAN Soji Caucus. I am wearing um, glasses. I have long black hair and I'm wearing a black polo shirt with golden details on the side. And I'm here to reiterate um, the reason why we were having this learning session this afternoon. If you were invited by someone else and um, you're probably wondering why we have this, it's under one of our projects called Forging Intersectional Feminist Futures where our aim is to strengthen intersectional movement building in Asia. And for us to be really intersectional, it's important to see the, the, the lived experiences of structurally excluded people. And that's why it's important for us to also learn about the experiences of persons with disabilities and also know how we can um, make our advocacy, our work more disability inclusive and accessible. Now, currently people have polarized views on the digital world. There are people who view it as dangerous because of widespread misinformation and online abuse, but it cannot be denied that the digital world has also helped um, make information more accessible to more people. Sabinga, uh, just like what Jael said in her video earlier, if we really want to reach more people, we have to learn how to make the digital world disability inclusive and accessible. And so folks, I welcome you all this afternoon for our learning session and I will pass this over to Anne, our host. Thank you, Jen. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Making the Digital World Disability Inclusive and Accessible. It is really heartwarming to see you take the time to participate in today's session. My name is Anne, and I'm an Asian woman with long brown hair. I'm wearing a dusty pink top, and I will be your host for today's webinar. A big shout out to the Asei and Soji Kakus and their partners for making this event possible. For our webinar to be accessible, sign language interpreters, closed captioners, and a copy of the presentation material have all been made available to you. Now, to formally open this event, I'd like to call on Mr. Brian David Pepito, Thurpcap's co-founder, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, let me just um, set my. Um, is my audio um clear? Uh, all right. Yes, sir, Brian. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian. Uh, Brian David, uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Earthcap. I'm wearing dark gray um polo shirt and uh, short hair and uh, uh, brown um, complexion. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining this um, learning session. And on behalf of the TERPCAP team, um, a warm welcome to all the participants in this webinar. Um, how timely it is to discuss about um, disability inclusion in this day and age, most especially that uh, we are celebrating the Disability Pride uh, Month this July. So with over a billion persons in the world who have disabilities and uh, most of whom do not have equal access to information through technology inspires us, um, our team, to deliver impact in the best way that we can. 
uh, my co-founders, um, Jael and uh, Jeff and I are actually persons with disabilities. So uh, ourselves, uh, we believe that um, inclusion is a key sustainable is a key and sustainable development uh, goal, and uh, we look forward to achieving our vision and uh, uh, with you on creating a world that is disability inclusive and uh, digitally accessible. So thank you everyone, and I hope you enjoy all uh, our activities for today's learning session. Back to you, Anne. Thank you so much, co-founder Brian. Now, before I introduce to you our speaker, allow me to acknowledge the following organizations who are present here today. We have with us Pantay, Imglad, Women's Aid Organization, Kanlungan Center Foundation Incorporated, Batis Aware Women's Organization Incorporated, Migrant Forum in Asia, Migrant Women Forum, Elijah Corpus Consulting, BDEV Child Protection, Visayas LBTQ Network, Camp Queer, UPCIDS Program on Alternative Development, Pinoy Deaf Rainbow Incorporated, Saori Organization, Youth for Mental Health Coalition Incorporated, Live and Learn, Live and Learn Cambodia, Philippine Human Rights Information Center. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Now, to maximize your learning experience, please observe the following house rules. First, is to keep your microphones on mute unless asked to recite. Also, introduce yourself first before sharing. Second, if comfortable, turn on video when it is your turn to speak or sign. Third, maximize the chat box to ask questions and relay comments and sharing. And number four, prepare to participate during group discussions. If you're all okay with that, may I ask everyone to give us a thumbs up so I can see that you've all um, understood the house rules clearly. Thank you so much. How about the others? Thank you so much. Okay, I guess we will now proceed. And now let me introduce you our speaker for today. She is the founder and CEO of TurpCap, a digital accessibility services company. She also serves as the current chief people officer of Virtual Ahan, a social business that trains and employs persons with disabilities and other excluded communities. She is a globally certified professional HR practitioner and a licensed psychometrician with over 10 years of professional experience eight years of which is human resource focus. And finally, she is a proud person with disability who is also an advocate of mental health, woman empowerment, and workplace inclusion. Everyone, let us all welcome Ms. Jael Cortez. Thank you so much, Anne. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope everyone is doing great. Um, I know it's a Tuesday afternoon and it's after lunch, and uh, but I appreciate everyone being here today and choosing to attend this webinar. So I'd like to see um, some heart reactions if you're all ready to you know, dig in and learn about what we can when it comes to making the digital world disability inclusive and accessible. So that those are beautiful, beautiful hearts. And I am receiving all the love this afternoon. <laughs> all right, so good afternoon, everyone. And yes, uh, of course, who is this training for? Um, definitely this training is meant for you and I who would like to explore um ways on how we can become inclusive towards our brothers and sisters who have disabilities um, i'm very proud to introduce also my team the turf cap team 100 percent of us are actually all persons with disabilities empowered to provide you know a lot of services as you can see uh, i'd like to kick this webinar off by introducing myself uh, personally so my name is Jael. I'm an Asian female with short black hair. I have a um, 
fair complexion and I have a mole in my near my temple. <laughs> I guess that's my most salient feature. So um, I'm very excited and very uh, pleased to be here and to be given this opportunity to speak about what I am most passionate about, and that is about disability inclusion and digital accessibility. So I'd like to also share the objectives of this workshop. Um, probably, you know, I was able to read through your responses when you filled out the pre-needs assessment form, and I am actually very much overwhelmed with the numerous interests that you have shared. Um, today, though, we are going to focus on two salient points, and that's really understand um, what disability inclusion is and digital accessibility is. And, you know, at the end of this workshop, hopefully we would all learn a thing or two when it comes to mindful practices on making the digital world friendly to all. So in our workshop, we will be covering five important topics. And of course, uh, we're going to talk about the specifics of disability inclusion. We're going to talk about digital accessibility, web content accessibility guidelines, how to make content on the web accessible, right? And of course, number four, we're going to discuss about reasonable accommodations that we can provide uh, towards persons with disabilities and of course, what the next steps would be after this webinar. So if you are all ready, can you all please give me a thumbs up reaction? If you're all ready and settled and um, really interested to learn this afternoon, really, really nice to know those reactions, everyone. So I guess we can, you know, kick this off with um, part one, and that's really about disability inclusion. But I did mention earlier that this is something that's very, very close to my heart, this topic. And that is something that I wish to share with you with this check-in question. Um, we can probably, you know, maximize and utilize the chat box whenever we hear or whenever we see or read uh, the two words combined, disability inclus inclusion, what usually comes to your mind? Um, we can utilize the chat box uh, to share our answers or responses. Disability inclusive, disability inclusion, what are the first things that come to our mind? And I will be leaving the chat box uh, for everyone to share um, their responses. But before that, you know, um, I'd like to share this guiding principle that I've always held on because as mentioned earlier during the introduction, I am a person with disability and it took some time for me to accept this guiding principle that disability is actually a natural part of human experience. Disability is not a curse. My disability is not something that I am less fortunate to have. Uh, my disability is not something that um, makes me unlucky, right? But it is part of my entire being as a person. And with this, I'd like to share um, a very short story about myself on how I can relate towards this 15% of the world's population. According to the World Health Organization, you know, a billion people or 15% of the world's population experience some form of disability. Probably those who are in this room, um, if you are a person without disability, probably um, you are not aware of it, but you know, this is something that we can do. This is a venue we're in, we can learn together. And I'd like to share on how disability inclusion actually saved me and made me accept that I am one of the 15%. So here's a very short, you know, personal introduction about myself. Um, I actually wasn't born um, as a person with disability. Um, I am a person with acquired disability. I actually grew in a very sad and abusive household and that contributed to the deterioration of my physical and mental health. And, you know, as early as 16, 17, I was already diagnosed with um, psychosocial um, disorders and that led me, of course, to become a person with disability. 
um, it's very difficult for, for persons without disability to accept that suddenly, you know, your life would change 180 degrees and that you would not be capable of doing things that you were able to do before. You know, before I became a person with disability, I loved running. I loved traveling, walking around. I loved moving. But right now, that's me. I'm a person with a walking, walking cane and I cannot move um, without that. So disability inclusion, being part of a community, um, and also other organizations making me feel that I am accepted, I am still loved, and I'm still capable. It actually saved me. Disability inclusion truly matters. It matters to me. And you know, I decided that because I experienced inclusion firsthand. I experienced people accepting me for who I was. I experienced people embracing um, my imperfections and still trusting me. Because sometimes if you are a person with, you know, you know, a person with apparent disabilities like having an orthopedic disability, it's sometimes easier to deal with versus those with non-apparent disabilities like psychosocial disabilities like um, reliability, uh, trustworthiness is on the line. Uh, can, can people truly trust those who have psychosocial disabilities such as myself? Um, can I be a good fit in any organization that I would be part of? Um, will I, am I truly capable of um, overcoming my realities and achieving my ultimate? So, you know, that's something that um, I really appreciate, um, you know, in my life that when I started to accept my disability and I started to, this, to decide that I would want to use my skills and my talents and my gifts to be able to be of help to other persons with disabilities, you know, I started to um, come up with this small company called Turf Gap and that's, that's what you see. Right now, um, we are a small company um, of nine employees, but all of us have, you know, collectively eleven disabilities. And um, in less than a year, we have uh, serviced so many clients for the past few months, and it is just amazing how organizations are slowly accepting and embracing persons with disabilities, slowly incorporating disability inclusion in their respective workplace. And I am telling you, everyone who is here right now, um, you decided to be here today. You are changing someone else's life, I'm telling you. Because um, being a person with disability, sometimes it gives us, um, it gives us uh, uh, a life without meaning. It contributes to that, but with the right support system, with the right environment, with the right organizations, with the right mindset, you know, you are also helping persons with disabilities be set up for success. So that is my personal story. I, I did not come from a very happy um, home and it contributed to, the, to that disability, but, right, but it does not hinder me and my team from achieving our um, collective vision on creating a world where digital content is accessible and inclusive for all. So being a person with orthopedic disability, I have limited movements. I can no longer work in corporate or I can no longer travel places that I used to go to. And having the opportunity um, to work from home, having the opportunity to use the web, having the opportunity to use um, technology to be able to aid inclusion is really one of life's biggest blessings. That is why we are committing to making the digital you know, content really accessible for all with the aid of technology. And of course, disability inclusion, um, as I said, it's really understanding the relationship between the way people function and how they participate in society. Um, we heard from last week's webinar that um, disability is not really about your health condition. 
right? Disability is about your health condition plus barriers in your life, and that contributes to your inabilities. But if society, if people are really, you know, intentional and would love to for persons with disabilities to fully participate in society, then we have to embrace disability inclusion. Disability inclusion also is ensuring that everybody has the same opportunities to participate in every aspect of life to the best of their abilities and desires. Um, you know, I kid you not. Though I have an orthopedic disability and a psychosocial disability, I believe in my skills and capability that I too can do what persons without disabilities can do. And it's a very, very, this topic is a very, very exciting one. So um, we know that persons with disabilities are you know, more likely to experience adverse socioeconomic outcomes in life, such as um, less education opportunities, um, there are poorer health outcomes, lower chances of employment, and higher poverty rates. And, you know, I, you know, one of the things that I'd like to highlight because of my um, years of experience in corporate um, is, you know, the, um, the labor system, the outdated labor, outdated labor system that we currently have here in the Philippines. You know, when persons with disabilities try to apply for a job, a pre-employment medical examination is required, or if they see you as a person with disability, there's an immediate, um, uh, there is an immediate uh, withdrawal, <laughs> or there is an immediate, um, I'd say they would they wouldn't consider your application because of your physical health condition. So there's a lot of discrimination that's going on, and this is you know the the current realities of persons with disabilities. So today, you know, it's I'm I'm very happy to know that slowly, you know, there is global awareness that's happening. Um, there is uh slowly this awareness on disability inclusive developments these are slowly increasing and initiatives like this that um you know jen and her team are doing is really something that is of great value as um, disability inclusive development and initiatives are increasing globally and that's a very very good news now of course uh we would also like to hear from the UNCRPD, wherein you know, they specifically reference the importance of um, international development in addressing the rights of uh, persons with disabilities. That is why um, I am very happy and proud to see you know, other nations uh, joining us here in the Philippines to also work and address and really hear uh, the rights of persons with disabilities. So as part of disability inclusion, and I'm sure um, you have heard some of these uh, general rules when it comes to um, etiquette or dealing towards others, we have what we call digital etiquette, okay? So since we're talking about digital accessibility, there's something that we call digital etiquette. I'm not sure, um, has anyone in the audience already heard of this term? Maybe you can give me a haha reaction <laughs> if you've already heard of this term, or you can first time. Oh, first time, says Jen. All right. So digital etiquette. So it's also called netiquette, <laughs> net for internet. So it's actually you know what we used to term when it comes to um, a basic set of rules that uh, we should follow to make the internet a better place for yourself and for others. So when we say, hey, have some netiquette, right? So um, that means let's please follow and make sure that the internet is safe. Sometimes we put a lot of things out there and it's no longer safe for others or it's no longer safe for us. So this is what we call netiquette. And we have some rules that we would like to share with everyone. And 
probably, you know, we can start being mindful when it comes to our netiquette or digital etiquette. So the first one is, you know, avoid language that may come across as strong or offensive. Um, now, this is a challenge because, um, hey, JL, what if I grew up in a community wherein our manner of speaking is just really strong? right, or offensive, what do I do? Then we have what we call positive scripting. This is something that eventually each and every individual or person can learn doing. Uh, sometimes it's really not what we say, but how we say it, correct? <laughs> Number two, we have what we call keep writing to a point and uh, stay on topic. So um, we, we can see, you know, on the internet, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of um, trolls, a lot of um, things that really put others down. Um, making the internet a safe place for everyone is being mindful on what we post, on what we write. And if we are speaking about a certain topic, then let it be about that topic only, right? Number three, it's, you know, read first, write later. Read first, comprehend first react later, uh, comment later, understand what's happening in your environment before we are quick to respond. Um, reading first is also like um, listening and comprehending first before responding. Number four, this is very, very important. Review, 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 then send. Um, I heard from my previous bosses that if you make some verbal remarks that aren't so pleasant, then that's quite forgivable as compared to the opportunity for you to revise a written remark, yet still you decided to send it over. Uh, that is quite unforgivable because uh, there's a lot of opportunity for us to review content before we send them out. Right, so this is really a mindful practice on how we can have netiquette. And of course, uh, do not send or forward or, or post inappropriate material. So for, you know, this is not just applicable for persons with disabilities. This is of course, um, a general rule that can really protect the general public and of course yourself. Um, and of course, um, the use of language is also very important. So having that netiquette, having that mindfulness that um, the internet is not my playground. The internet can either make or break people or um, the output I put out there can either make or break, can either inspire or not inspire people. And, you know, aside from that netiquette, it's really, you know, the use of language very important. Um, and with the use of language, I'd like to share, you know, um, on how we can be more mindful, um, on how we can be more respectful when it comes to really um, dealing with persons with disabilities. Hey, JL, I met this person with disability. I don't know how to address this disability. I don't know how to call him. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be so offensive if I'm going to call him this, him or her this you know, this type of disability. So, well, this is why we are going to learn about certain terms that are acceptable and that are not acceptable. But before that, I'd like to do a very quick room check. Um, is everyone still active and um, kicking? Can you please give me a heart reaction if you're all still active, actively listening? <laughs> awesome, thank you so much, everyone. So. Um, I understand that in the previous webinar, some of these were all already discussed, uh, but I still hope you can you can get you know additional insights from this discussion. So let's start with um, the usual, and that is you know um, persons with disabilities are abnormal or handicapped or disabled. Um, yes, disabled also these days are no longer acceptable. In the past, um, we, we can say that Jael is disabled, but now I'd rather hear you say that Jael is a person. Person, I'm a person with 
a disability. It's it's like saying that, um, let's say Jael is a failure versus Jael failed the test. So it's quite different, right? The approach it's it is less discriminatory. It is less assumptive. Um, when you say person with disability, and that's the acceptable term, versus disabled or handicapped or abnormal, because disability, again, as 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 I shared, you know, as our guiding principle, it is not an abnormality. Hey, it's okay to have a disability. Hey, it's okay to have this um, to, to um, ex- embrace your sexual orientation. Hey, it's okay to be this way, right? So it's okay to have a disability. Um, another non-acceptable term. Oh my. Um, some of us may be guilty. Normal. <laughs> oh, she looks normal or able-bodied. <laughs> so, um, yes, ladies and gentlemen, everyone. <laughs> um, normal or able-bodied. Um, these are unacceptable terms when it comes to, um, you know, having a respectful disability language. Uh, because again, uh, we can't say that you're normal and I am abnormal, right? So instead of saying normal or um, able-bodied, we can say person or people without disability. So probably, probably you've been hearing me say this earlier. So person or people without disability, okay? And um, of course, you know, the next three, I'll be showing them in a jiffy. So we have here deaf and dumb or deaf mute or pipe. Oh, this is really a big no-no. Um, even if the deaf cannot hear for some of them, they can lip read the word pipe. And really, excuse me, um, this is very, very offensive for them. So why is it so, right? Um, deaf and dumb, because the only thing that the deaf can't do is to hear, but everything else, their thought process, their skills, you know, everything, their organs, their, you know, how, how their body is, you know, the, their body structure, it's, 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 everything is functional, everything's functioning well. So um, if we're talking about deaf with hearing loss, then that's you know, a small d for deaf. But because the deaf community has their own unique culture, unique language, we refer to the community with a capital D, okay? So when we say deaf community, then that's a capital D. We spell deaf with a capital D. Um, if we're just referring to a person with a hearing loss, then small d for deaf. So he is deaf or she is deaf. Um, then that they are deaf. Then that's okay. All right. Now we also have here um, a person suffering from. Okay. So again, having this having a disability is not a suffering. It's not a curse. It's not an abnormality. So. Probably, you know, sometimes I hear this usually when people regard us, those with psychosocial disability, like a person suffering from depression or a person suffering from bipolar disorder. Um, really, really no. Um, instead, by being respectful, we can say a person who has orthopedic disability or a person who has bipolar disorder or a person who has um, psychosocial disorder or disability rather. So, you know, it's important that we see the person first, um, not the disability. Um, we have a couple more words here. So just a couple more before we proceed with our breakout sessions, <laughs> okay? So I hope everyone's ready for the breakout session. Um, hearing impaired is actually fine, but only if you are a medical practitioner, like a physician or a doctor, okay? Um, and we also hear sometimes hard of hearing individuals or HOH. 
Now, these are inter these are in individuals who were born with with um, a sense of hearing, and over time, they would experience mild to, to severe hearing loss. So it means they were able to acquire speech. They were able to, you know, communicate via speaking, and that would be their um, natural language before they start um, learning probably signs or before they start relying on captions. So hard of hearing individuals are not necessarily um, identified as part of the deaf community. So they are two separate communities, actually. All right. Um, yes, sometimes, you know, you know, I can be guilty here sometimes. Insane, lunatic, mental, and psychotic. Sometimes because when we, we when we tease our friends, we friend, baliw, right? Baliw to. Sometimes we say that. And honestly, these are offensive terminologies. Very offensive terminology. <laughs> so even as a joke, let's refrain, right? Uy, baka ma-mental ka na, ha? Ma-mental, right? If maybe you'd be uh, brought to the mental hospital, right? So, you know, the proper way of saying this is, you know, being a person with psychosocial disability. Uh, another, another term, of course, is uh, mongoloid, right? Mongoloid or down, very derogatory. So we can say a person with Down syndrome, okay? And of course, invalid or mentally retarded, these are very derogatory terms. So we can refer to them as a person with intellectual disability, and finally, you know, one of my favorites, <laughs> um, crippled, iika ika or pilay. Um, uh, it, it sounds better sa English. <laughs> Orthopedic disability. But um, really, um, Jael, you know, this was raised to me a um, few weeks ago. What if a person carelessly calls you pilay but in a malambing manner <laughs> like uy bakit ka na pi but ka pilay right is that acceptable or not okay so if um you are able it really depends with the person you are speaking with or dealing with if you have formed um, a special connection or bond you probably can ask these questions but as a general rule there is uh, there is no room for the whys. Uh, bakit ka bulag? Why are you blind? Why are you deaf? What happened to you? Um, why do you have a psychosocial disability? Uh, can't you just think positive? No, 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 no. So these are some respectful, um, I mean, some ways on how we can be respectful and that's in the manner of our language. Sometimes we don't have to be um, really familiar with everything what's what's happening, you know, it's a spectrum of disability, but just being mindful with our language can help with disability inclusion. All right. So is everyone still there? <laughs> because um, we would like to hear from you naman this time. Okay. Uh, we will be giving everyone um, 10 minutes to get to know each other We'll be putting you in small breakout room. And um, we would like you to introduce yourselves, of course, to each other. And if you can also share why inclusion matters to you. And maybe later on when we get back here um, in the plenary session, we can hear from you, from some of you about, about your responses. All right, so if everyone is ready to be part of the breakout session. Can you please give me a thumbs up reaction if everyone's ready? Thumbs up reaction, everyone's ready. Okay, awesome. So our tech support will start opening the breakout rooms. So we will see everybody in uh, 10 minutes. All right. So take it away to our tech support. Great to hear. All right. So. Um, all right, so I guess we are all back from our quick break. <laughs> ano ba yan? Nararatal ako doon sa recording. But anyway, yes. Uh, hold on na, hold on po.
sorry, intermission number. <laughs> okay, so yes, we are back and we will be discussing our part two and that is about digital accessibility this time. And this is going to be in connection to parts three and four and eventually part five. So digital accessibility, as we all know it, definitely is something that refers to an inclusive type of practice wherein we intentionally remove those barriers that prevent interaction or access to websites, digital tools and technologies, and even collaterals. So I heard earlier from Ryan, right, that you know, there were a lot of um, collaterals, but without alternative text, it wasn't really made accessible. And that is actually correct. That is the goal of digital accessibility. And, um, and uh, that the, is the practice of um, making sure that we would be able to remove these barriers, um, especially for uh, persons with disabilities whenever they are using the web. All right, so if your organization, whichever organization you are part of, if your organization is operating a website or operating or offering a mobile application, you know, ac accessibility is a very, very crucial consideration. And for most organizations in the public and private sectors, you know, it's legally required. So um, I'd like to, of course, um, do a very quick check in with your respective organizations. You do not need to chat. Just think, you know, just think it to yourselves. Um, if you, if your organization is currently practicing um, accessibility guidelines, <laughs> is our website accessible? Are our flyers accessible? Um, is our con is everything that we're doing with our content? Are all of these things accessible? So you know, let's think of that at the back of our minds, and let us start going to part three, and that is web content accessibility guidelines, or WCAG, um, as popularly known. Okay. So let's start with web content accessibility guidelines. So um, these set of guidelines are actually created for us to be able to define on how web content can be made more accessible with the goal of, of course, uh, providing a single shared standard. And um, it is important because, you know, we all come from different locations, different countries, and we do not know, is there really a standard way on how the content we put out there, um, if, is there a standard way wherein we can make our websites accessible? How can we be inclusive even in our technology, you know, that um, those who have disabilities won't feel frustrated? So let's say, you know, for example, that your website is click based for example it's a website we're in you are required to have a mouse and try to click on the pictures it's not keyboard accessible so for those who have orthopedic condition or disability or those with quadri who have quadriplegia or those who can no longer move their bodies um, using a mouse is not helpful not accessible for them so these are, you know, some mindful things that we will discuss this afternoon. So WCAG 2.0, um, it's the, really the most widely accepted set of recommendations. So it's like a, a collection of recommendations. Um, I'd be happy to share the link a little bit later on, on how you and maybe your tech team, technology team, or IT team can explore and refer to so that, you know, going back to your respective organizations, hey, we have a, we have a guideline here. Are we following it? Because if we are not, if we are still, um, if our effects in our website still has those blinking effects, I don't think that's accessible anymore. Um, and we are going to discuss that in a GIF. Okay, so um, when WCAG guidelines or WCAG um, is followed, it improves basically the usability for everyone. Um, at the end of the day, yes, uh, we are very mindful for, you know, towards persons with disabilities, but it also improves um, 
usability for all. Um, even if you are a person without disability, it enhances the user experience, as we call it. Now, here's a Snapchat of how the WCAG um, looks like. So it's something like this. It's a guideline. As you can see, um, I'm sharing on my screen a screenshot of uh, WCAG. And it specifically um, talks about uh, alternative text. Okay, so the, the need for alternative text. Um, I'll be happy to share the link to this website. As you can see, on the left side, there are um, already some recommendations there. Um, if there are pre-recorded contents, there should be an audio description. So as you uh, probably must have heard in our countdown, so we are um, also adding audio last 30 seconds, you know, uh, we're doing a countdown. Uh, there should also be sign language interpretation for pre-recorded videos, uh, extended audio description, or um, let's say captions. If it's live, there should be captions. There should be also um, audio only or video only uh, pre-recording. So these are some guidelines. And as mentioned, I'll be happy to share the link to this later on. So. I know that it, it does seem like a lot to take in, right? Like there are so many uh, links embedded within the links and it's just really confusing. So Jael, you know, in a nutshell, uh, we would like to see how can we make uh, digital content accessible? So yes, we got you. And we are going to summarize the guiding principles into four. Um, and that would be, you know, uh, think of the word poor, right? P-O-U-R. So it says here, a guiding principle when it comes to accessible content, it has to be number one, P for perceivable, O for operable, U for understandable, and R for robust. So let's, you know, dig in into these uh, guiding principles of accessibility based from WCAG version 2.0. Okay, so these definitions are from the Web Accessibility Initiative. Um, this is the link. I'll be happy to share it in a bit. Okay, so uh, let's proceed. You know, in a nutshell, uh, summarizing everything, uh, when we say perceivable, it, it basically means that a user can identify the content and interface elements by means of the senses, a sense of sight. Um, it, it could be sense of sight and um, sense of hearing. So there, um, if it is, if um, you are deaf, of course, then there should be um, a reasonable accommodation, like a sign language interpreter inset inside that video. If you are blind or visually impaired, then that uh, material or content should have, you know, at least alternative text or audio description. So that's something that, you know, is uh, perceivable. It's perceived by the senses, whichever um, sense. Now, the prob you know, a sample problem here is, let's say, you have a word document, and it contains um, a number of non-English words and phrases, right? And your audience are, uh, can only understand either English text or uh, Filipino or Tagalog text. Um, or there are symbols that are not really familiar. Sometimes we, we add symbols that are not familiar when we communicate. So, you know, a solution to this is to provide uh, text alternatives for any non-text content. So it means, you know, it can be changed into other forms that uh, people need. So as mentioned earlier, if there is a video of a person speaking and a deaf person cannot understand, we can, you know, change it into another form that the deaf could understand the content by adding a sign language interpreter in that video. So for the deaf, even if the person is speaking, it, the, the content is perceivable because of the sign language interpreter inset that we added and even the closed captions. We also have overoperable. It means, you know, in a nutshell, it means that the user can successfully use the controls. 
the buttons, the navigation, and other interactive elements. So this is what I was sharing earlier. Now, there are persons with disabilities who can no longer use uh, the mouse, who cannot um, really, they do not, they are unable to have functional fingers, right? Uh, to be able to use the mouse. So there, the problem is some of our content right now or nowadays is that, you know, your mouse has to hover um, or your mouse has to click before you see the content. So mouse-dependent web content, this is really inaccessible. So let's try to maybe, you know, in our organizations, if you have your company websites, um, is your website accessible if you're simply going to use your mouse, your your keyboard? Um, if you if you do Control Tab, can you uh, can you shift to the other um, areas of your website by just using your keyboard? Can you navigate through your website by using your keyboard? Okay. If not, and you need a mouse, then we need to think of ways on how to convert it so that it could be operable. So the solution here, uh, the best recommendation is to ensure that it's keyboard accessible because this is the one of the most important principles when it comes to web accessibility. Why? Because it cuts across disability types. So it doesn't only apply for those who um, uh, have orthopedic uh, disability, even those who have a visual impairment, um, even those who have uh, neurodivergent disabilities, uh, being keyboard accessible, if your website is keyboard accessible, then it benefits and it gives um, persons with disabilities a better user experience. All right. I know it's a lot to take in, but we're almost there. <laughs> okay, so another thing is that uh, another guiding principle towards accessibility is that it should be understandable. So the description here is that users must be able to understand the content and, you know, learn and remember how to use your site. So I understand that there are uh, some types of businesses wherein probably highfalutin words or uh, complex words or very deep words can be appreciated by some. But if we truly want to be inclusive, if we truly want to um, initiate or advocate for accessibility, then we are recommending that the content, the words that even we use, should be easily understood. So let's say, for example, um, the problem is a, a website. There's a lot of abbreviations right? A lot of abbreviations, a lot of acronyms, a lot of jargons. If I am a person who, has, who is not really exposed to all of these um, jargons and acronyms, and I wouldn't have, you know, that interest to read through the website because it is just too difficult to understand. So, um, you know, a solution to this is let us make the text content readable and understandable by the general public, right? And finally, um, you know, in conclusion, of course, to the guiding principles towards accessibility, is it, it has to be robust. Number four, robust. When we say robust, the, the content that we're putting out there, um, it should be enough that it can be interpreted reliably by a wide variety of users. So let's say, for example, it's allowing them to choose uh, the technology that they use to interact with websites. So let's say, for example, um, a website requires um, a specific version because, you know, there are websites that are like this. Eh? You cannot access the website unless your, um, your tech version or your, uh, what do you call this, um, your app version is outdated, right? Sometimes we receive that prompt. Uh, sometimes even in our cell phones, like we cannot open a certain app unless we go to Google Play and update the app. So uh, those kind of websites we're in, you can only visit that website if this is your level of um, uh, application in terms of the technological uh, requirement. So that, that's a really a concern. If the website requires a specific version of a web browser or your web browser has to be this version or it has to 
um has this have this type of um element so the, for you to be able to access the features now a solution to this is to maximize compatibility you know if um windows 7 windows 8 windows 10 for example um you, um, uh, a person who is using Microsoft Word via Windows 10 may not be able to open a document from a person who used to uh, save a document using Windows 7, something like that, right? So also when it comes to the websites, um, let's ensure that um, whichever uh, elements that we will be putting out there, it is compatible. Uh, for future user agents, and it also should include assistive technologies like screen readers. Um, you know, it's important. That's why uh, connecting with different groups with these specialization, let's say we would like to um, tap, uh, uh, is it all right? <laughs> Maybe we would like to tap uh, Novel, right? If we need uh, their assistance, if they would, they could support us and help us check if our uh, content is a screen reader friendly because uh, I, we're not sure on how to use a screen reader, for example, and we have the intention on making the content really accessible for all, right? So this is a very excellent space uh, for us to really connect with each other and, you know, help towards our same goal and vision on digital accessibility and disability inclusion, all right? So these are the four guiding principles when it comes to uh, digital accessibility. So um, in a bit, uh, I'll, I'll be sharing my screen, <laughs> all right? I, I mean, I'll be sharing the link rather uh, so that you can have a better guidance on the specifics, right, on these guidelines, okay? So um, going to our fourth part, uh, but before that, before we discuss reasonable accommodations, um, if you have any questions top of mind, feel free to use the chat box so that later on during our question and answer, we can go through them together and uh, I'd be happy to give my responses a little bit later on, all right? Um, so I guess we can proceed with our fourth part. And uh, this is really reasonable accommodations. And again, disability, right, is not about your health condition or as others say, impairment, right? But uh, it's really the having barriers with, and uh, having no access to reasonable accommodation that contributes to disability. So let's talk about um, reasonable accommodations. Now, again, I know this is a quite uh, text heavy, but uh, according to UNCRPD or the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Article 2, under definitions, um, so then it is a uh, necessary and appropriate uh, type of modification and adjustments, not imposing a disproportionate or unbur undue burden where needed in a particular case to ensure to persons with disabilities the enjoyment or exercise on an equal basis with others of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. So reasonable accommodation is also two-way. So it says here, it, it should not also impose a disproportionate or undue burden towards, let's say, an employer. For example, an employer right, uh, needs to really, um, uh, for example, wants to hire a person who is uh, using a wheelchair. Uh, the employer uh, doesn't really need to spend hundreds of thousands and millions just to renovate the entire building because this may provide undue burden, right? But what the employer can do and ask that person with um, who is using a wheelchair um, is to consider that uh, operations at least should be in the first, you know, on the first floor, uh, someone who doesn't really need to use the stairs because there are some buildings that still do not have elevators, correct? And um, reasonable accommodations is really being able to, you know, connect with uh, the person with disability and identify the limitations 
not focus on the disability that, hey, you're using a wheelchair, you might suffer, huh? you might have a hard time if you need to go to the third floor, right? But, you know, providing reasonable accommodations is, do we have a vacant floor? Um, do we have a vacant room or operations area in the first floor so that it's easier for this person with disability to, you know, report to work, something like that. So at the end of the day, uh, when we provide reasonable accommodations, it is to ensure that persons with disabilities enjoy and exercise that equal basis. You know, both of us can report to work. Both of us can work in any industry. Um, even if you are a person without disability, and I am a person with disability, as long as I have reasonable accommodations, then I will be able to thrive also in whichever industry. So, you know, um, we have here some recommended uh, reasonable accommodations. Now, uh, this is very, very practical uh, for everyone. So let's say with digital content. Ayan. So digital content, we have uh, marketing communications posters, collateral. It could be in the form of images, pictures, photos, right? Or kaya um, uh, moving video, moving pictures. So nagiging videos. So um, how can we provide reasonable accommodation uh, through these content? So as, of course, shared in our um, WCAG as derived from there, it's important if uh, to those who are part of the marketing team next time, right? If there will, you will be posting like a, an image on Facebook or there's an upcoming event, uh, let's Maximize because Facebook has this feature called alternative text, adding alternative text. But if it is difficult for you, um, adding image descriptions would also be um, very, very helpful. Now, we are also seeing ha, posters with QR codes. Okay, this is very innovative. Yes, but let us consider also those um, who could not really use the QR code feature or function. Because again, it is using a specific um, sense of our body. So if ever you still want to roll that out, na there is a poster with a QR code, um, probably we can have um, a link embedded to it. Uh, but again, as much as possible, it should be something that can be um, keyboard accessible. Because even if there's an event link that's embedded, right, it's still click. It requires you to click the poster. So if we can come up with something, maybe the link is, you know, on the image description or on the caption itself, that would be great. And I'd also I'd also be very, very happy to share another free tool called a color contrast analyzer. This will help our marketing and communications team for you to, if you know, if you want to add captions to the videos or if you want to add uh, captions or text all over your photo, this color contrast analyzer, it's a free online tool, will help identify if it is an accessible uh, feature or an, I mean, if it's an accessible choice or not. So let's say you decided to put, you know, there's like a, a video all green and then you decided to add uh, captions to the video just black text then it would give you a red mark it's not accessible the colors are not are really contrasting okay so i'll also be very much happy to share that on the chat box later on and again let's remember keyboard operable and for for videos um you know it's very important that we connect with um some of our friends or people we know um, on how, let's say, for example, for TerpCap, we have um, our own uh, visually impaired uh, specialist who also gives us recommendations on how to make content accessible. So, you know, he's a fan of audio descriptive initiatives and even voiceover initiatives. So, if you wish to <laughs> hear from him, let me know. And so, aside from digital content, marketing and communications, posters, and collaterals. Uh, we also have, right, online, online events there, pre-recorded videos, pre-recorded -pre events. So just a few tips and tricks 
Um, also, during online events, it's really nice that we're making it a practice, you know, having that descriptive self-introduction in a group. Hi, I'm an Asian female. Uh, I have short black hair. That's really, really a good practice. Another practice that I would like to share with you is, you know, before we speak and recite, we introduce ourselves also again. So um, let's say I'd like to recite, um, hi, um, hi, this is Sarah from TurfCap, or the, hi, this is, sorry, hi, this is Jael from TurfCap. Uh, yes, I do have a question. So instead of saying, okay, who has a question? Hey, I have a question. So that, let's say those who um, are, those who are visually impaired can also identify who is speaking, not just, uh, unless uh, you are always uh, together, then they would already be familiar with your voice, okay? And another thing, of course, is uh, sign language interpretation. Um, it's very important that we also receive feedback from the, the, the community members who or the participants of the webinar, let's say. Um, what we want to do is to provide quality interpretation. Okay, so it's not just enough that, hey, we hired a sign language interpreter, that's good. We have to make sure that we connect again with the deaf participants and also ask them to assess, um, was the interpreter effective? Was the interpreter someone that you would recommend to see in the next webinar? Um, because we have to consider um, the reasonable accommodation for the deaf. Uh, we're not providing an interpreter just for compliance. We really want to make sure that they are included and that you know their voice matters and they are fully aware of what is being discussed in the group. And number three, of course, we have your closed captions. Now, I was able to read in a pre in our pre-needs assessment form. Is there any technology, right, that could do code switching between English and um, Filipino or Tagalog? Because sometimes it's difficult for us to really speak in straight English, where in the captions the live transcript can easily um, capture, but suddenly when we speak in our in vernacular or when we suddenly speak in our native language, then the captions do no, uh, are no longer accurate. So um, what we really do in TurpCap is really we invest in manual captioners with a very high typing speed because um, we understand the need and, um, you know, our, our co-founders are also part of hearing themselves. And it's the feeling that when they read a caption, it's all good. And then suddenly, it, the words are no longer of any sense. It is quite um, disheartening, right? It's, it's no longer inclusive. Um, even with our recommended wardrobe, did you know that those with stripes or those with... Um, too much uh, shining things on your clothes are not really accessible because instead, you know, instead of focusing on the content or on you who is speaking, sometimes the clothes can become a, a disturbance or a hindrance also, or a barrier, correct? Most especially for those who are visual learners, not only the deaf, but even those with learning disabilities, even those with, um, let's say, um, other spectrums of autism who cannot concentrate. Uh, it's important that we, our wardrobe, our virtual backgrounds, you know, as much as possible, we can keep it plain and also have less accessories. And these are some mindful practices that uh, we, are, we would love to share with everyone. So I guess I'll, be st uh, I'll stop sharing my slide in this particular section. And I know that we discussed a lot of things, most especially with digital accessibility, reasonable accommodations. So I'd be happy to accommodate some questions or anything that you've learned from this particular segment that you wish to share or echo this afternoon. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, any questions so far uh, before we you know, move because we have, we will be having another breakout session after this. Any questions so far, comments, reaction that you would like to share this? I believe this is a quiet group. <laughs> okay, any questions so far? 
Yes, Ma'am Sheila. Good afternoon. Hello again, everyone. This is Sheila speaking. And um, I just would like to like make some additional on, on what you have said about reasonable accommodation, Jael. And like just make kind uh, little ano, uh, differentiation on accessibility and reasonable accommodation. Not to confuse everyone, but just to say that when we say accessibility, it is like a standard. It is something that you should that should be there before we implement a, a program, we build a facility, we uh, organize a meeting. So, for example, like this session, when you say there is accessibility, it's like um, there's already, you know, you have organized for a closed captioner, a sign language interpreter, and uh, people are aware that, you know, the, there will be like description and everything. But when we say reasonable accommodation, it can be the, the individual requirement of a person that is not captured by the accessibility standard. So meaning, for me, for example, um, uh, the, the accessibility that we have provided here is uh, the Filipino Sign Language. However, the deaf, the deaf participant is unschooled. So that person may need a deaf relay interpreter. That's the specific requirement uh, of that person from the other deaf participants. So that is like reasonable accommodation. So it's like if uh, everything has been provided, but it's not existing yet, to respond to the individual need of the person, then that is reasonable accommodation. So like, for example, again, for a building, so the accessibility standard is that there should be ramp. But how? But if what if the ramp is not access, there's no ramp or no elevator, then will the interview may be conducted on the first floor of the building to accommodate a person using a wheelchair. So yeah, thanks Jael and super great amazing. Sharing. Thank you, Shields. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila. Yes, um, that is why you know working in this type of uh, setting, you know, we're learning from each other, and really a best a better way to say it. Thank you so much, Sheila. And yes, pati uh, si Jen. Thank you, Ren. Um, I'm also seeing questions here, Jael from Hi Ryan. There are some suggestions on visual design. So I read somewhere that even choice of colors layout text have impacted persons with psychosocial disabilities. Yes, that is true. Mahikita po natin. Oops, sorry. <laughs> we will be seeing um, on the uh, WCAG um, outline that I'll be sharing, uh, even those that are blinky is not really um, recommended because it triggers seizures. So there are some things like that, okay, it triggers emotions. Um, that is why digital accessibility is also very important to me because in the past, I thought, um, I actually, Ryan, I do also have a psychosocial disability. I'm always wondering why I'm always impatient when it comes to visiting or reading through websites that uh, do not have, um, the, 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 they're not following the color wheel chart when it comes to the complementary colors. You know, um, it just annoys me. I thought before it just really annoys me and it, it um, um, hinders my concentration. But later on, I realized that I'm not alone. That's, what I, that's, that's why I, I mentioned that disability inclusion is very important. Uh, because even in the digital space, um, it, it, there, it makes sense that uh, persons with different disabilities have, um, you know, various experiences towards a specific content of a website. So we can, uh, I'd be happy to share more of that uh, through the links that I'll be providing. So yes, I'll be sharing the contrast checker for the colors. And then, of course, um, the WCAG, yung guidelines mismo. All right. So um, do we have other questions before we proceed with our breakout sessions? 
none so far. So I guess our our, our tech support can already share um our I think there is there is one question in the chat uh, box, JL from Jack. One from Jack. Oh, sorry yeah. about that. Let me regarding different. Oh, scientific. oh, uh, I'm scrolling up now. Thank you so much. Hi, Jack. Question: As far as I understand, sign language is different in different regions, right? So, to hold example cross regional conferences, would this be help still be helpful, or closed captioning is better? Maybe the best person to answer this. Um, although I am knowledgeable of the answer, maybe it's a deaf person as well. Maybe Disney can help me answer this question. On Disney, for Disney, um, if we do have our event conference or any any kind of events, we for us for the deaf, we need a closed caption because it's uh, it does facial expression, and um, uh, for the as a deaf person, it's really important for us to have this uh, uh, this. Uh, interpreter sign language interpreter and for the closed caption more mostly uh, uh, the one who needs this is for the hard of hearing person or those who are uh, uh, yeah late deaf and person because they do not know how to uh, sign thank you all right and how about disney um if we can help also uh jack's question um, let's say you know there are different um, nationalities, uh, different deaf, so a, a Korean deaf, uh, a Japanese who is deaf, a Filipino deaf. Um, what reasonable accommodation can we provide for easier understanding? Yeah, um, for us, uh, we can use the international sign language. <laughs> Or else uh, we can have, um, uh, we have an international sign language interpreter and we also have um, in the respective uh, countries, uh, they have their Korean sign language or Filipino sign language. So there's a lot of um, interpreters out there uh, signing at the same time. Um, it happens when I was in Japan, there's a, uh, as uh, me as a Filipino, I do have a Filipino sign language interpreter and there's a Japanese sign language interpreter provided for the uh, deaf, uh, deaf Japanese and there's a um, yeah and and we will decide as a deaf person we will decide um, if we will hire or get uh, an interpreter or not mm -hmm. and we also decide if this is quali a qualified one for us or not thank you yes so really the the answer is um, to have the local interpreter and an international interpreter that would really be helpful so um, I, I did also experience that here in the Philippines, uh, a Japanese person who doesn't understand Filipino sign language. So we were like three interpreters, an international, a Japanese, and a Filipino sign language interpreter. But what's important is that we're able to, you know, put the message across. Okay, awesome, awesome. Yes, <laughs> thanks Disney. I do remember that experience as well. All right, so um, I guess there are no other questions. So our tech support can already start setting up uh, the breakout sessions or the breakout rooms. Um, we do have um, you know, a question here. So the question that we will be discussing during the breakout session, which is also another 10 minutes, is you know, how can you apply what you have learned about uh, digital accessibility to your personal, it could be your personal brand, your, your business, your company, or even to your organization. How can you be a contributor to ensure that, you know, the content that you're putting out there is accessible? There you go. So this is, um, you'll be given 10 minutes and you'll be uh, receiving a breakout notification. So I guess if that's ready to our tech support, then we can already start uh, sending them to their breakout rooms. I'll be chatting as well the questions so that you can still answer it in while you are in your respective rooms.
Um, and that's yes, recording in progress, please. All right, awesome. Okay, so and that is really to invest on learning, learning, and learning because uh, this is not just a one-time uh, thing. This is not just a one-time investment. Uh, definitely, we need to invest in learning and development initiatives so that we, we can become more familiar, we can become uh, better in terms of our decision-making, and of course, uh, understand more uh, the rights and, per and privileges of persons with disabilities. So number one, uh, it's really to acknowledge the disability and focus more on identifying the exact limitations that need to be accommodated. So this is one thing that I was um, sharing earlier. Um, if you are to onboard or hire a person with disability, um, instead of looking at possible attrition issues, or maybe it's very risky to hire this person with a chronic illness, uh, probably identify what are the limitations uh, that need to be accommodated. Uh, do we need to work on um, a new schedule, work schedule? Can we work on a flexible working schedule, right? Um, can this person work from home? Uh, because um, we understand the importance of digital accessibility. Um, can this person thrive even if he or she or they are not... Um, going to report in the workplace, right? Um, and of course, number two, it's also important that uh, we would invest in learning and development initiatives um, in the organization, in the, in the company. And the goal is really to equip, uh, to empower uh, the company and the organization to, of course, uh, work with persons with disabilities. And number three is really my favorite. And that's to consult with industry experts in terms of disability, uh, disability inclusion and digital accessibility. That is why um, we, different organizations, are here connected with one another. Um, should we need each other's support? then we can definitely tap each other. We have a common reference person from ASEAN Soji. Thank you so much, uh, Ryan, Jen, for connecting all of us organizations so that we can really work together in creating a disability-inclusive um, digital world, right? And um, really, that uh, ends the presentation and the sharing for this afternoon. Now, I, I can see that there are, um, oh, there are, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome pala. No, so I thought there were some questions, but if there are some questions, you know, I'd be very happy to accommodate. Um, and were you able to take note if there were questions that I was able to miss earlier or so far uh, we responded to each of it? Yes, we have already responded to each of it. But a while ago, we saw that um, Ryan said, Erika has a question. Erika, do you still have a question for Ms. Jael? Or none? If you have any questions, um, please do uh, raise it now. So that Ms. Jael could um, address those. I think none. No questions. I, yes. So, like, I have a question regarding language. What about the use of blind in context that do not describe disabilities? For example, gender blind. Oh, yes, yes. Um, thank you very much, Silla. Uh, so, regarding language, what about the use of blind in context? that do not describe disabilities or crippled, ah, crippled. Um, in terms of these uh, terms, then this is definitely uh, not offensive um, because uh, it is not referring to, to a person. Um, it is uh, referring to an object. <laughs> so let's say, for example, a crippled democracy. Um, yes, uh, that is one of the terms that we frequently here nowadays. Um, however, um, well, the gender blind type of um, 
terminology, I believe um, one of my colleagues here can help me respond to this because there is already an association of the word uh, blind. Uh, Sheila, would you like to help me answer this question? Yeah, thanks, Jael. Uh, this is Sheila again speaking. And um, thank you for that question. Um, well, uh, for me, it's those are like very of, of offensive, at least at my personal view, because if you come to think of it, why is it called blind and why is it called uh, like crippled democracy? So it's like uh, when we think, uh, when we look at the definition of uh, these words, it has a negative uh uh, meaning right so gender blind it means you are not looking uh it's not like it mean i mean it's crippled democracy it means the the democracy is like uh functioning well or uh blind is not looking uh, at it or something like you are not um like uh you are like um there it's dark, something like that. So it's uh, it gives us the connotation that being a person who is blind or a, per a person who is not walking or has physical impairment is something that is negative and it promotes uh, stigma. So like like for again going back to the word blind it gives us the connotation that when when it's blind it's like unaware of things or unaware of uh, your what's happening around yeah so um you're not certain of things so it 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 like creates a stigma uh perpetuates the stigma for people with uh, you know, people with disabilities. We can just say that you know the, the democracy is not democracy is not like function functioning or democr the democracy is not you know really uh, um, true or genuine or the the uh, the, the 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 gender uh, the language that was used or the action that was used is uh, discriminatory discriminatory of gender or bias to gender. So I think that's uh, more appropriate rather than associating things with uh, people who has this kind of uh, at, uh, identities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. We are really learning from each other. So, you know, in these type of um, situations as well, Probably even the remarks, Sheila, no, love is blind. <laughs> or yung mga, you know, these type of things, at least we are being more yes. mindful. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. mm, it really differs, honestly. Like, um, it, again, in my case, uh, I know that people will call me crippled. But for, for some reason, um, I am not quite offended when I hear crippled currency. It's like something na. You know, again, it, it differs, but again, because we discussed about respectful language, disability language, I think it's really best what uh, Sheila shared. Let's go away. And on the chat, very interactive. There are other ways to refer to these type of uh, people. So let's say um, part of uh, the disability community, it's better to be gender neutral. Yeah, okay. So we are learning together. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much. Um, I personally, it is uh when when I got connected with um a CN Soji caucus, um uh, my horizon started to really uh, widen in terms of intersectionality because in the past I I'm only operating in the space of disability, right? But now I'm also learning together with everyone. So thank you very much. So. Tina is also asking. Thank you so much, Sheila. Again, very value adding your um, responses. Thank you very much. Um, we also have here, how are we going to say it in Tagalog or Filipino? What terms do you use that are inclusive? Do you have a list of terminologies for us to refer to? Well, yes, there are acceptable terminologies. Um, we will also need to consult with other communities. So let's say, for example, for the deaf, 
Um, I heard that bingi is acceptable, but they still prefer deaf. Um, for those who are visually impaired ba, Michelle, uh, is bulag acceptable or dapat visually impaired? Uh, yes, thank you, Jael, for ask. Uh, for asking, yeah. Actually, in the on persons with visual impairment uh, uh, imp uh, group, there's no really consensus. There are people who collectively, even uh, they have you know visual impairment, they will collectively mm -mm. call us like blind. And uh, mm. even though we have like people like us who have low vision, mm. um, but at least for like for novel as an organization we really promote the person first language so taong bulag o taong may malabong paningin lagi pong yeah. it's always po the person na uh, first mm. kasi nga yun po ang talagang gusto naming ee what we want to promote to everybody yeah beautiful beautiful and that really um that echoes our discussion earlier na Let's do the person first, talaga, no? Um, so instead of saying, uh, you know, uh, let's say baliw or something like that. So at least we now know uh, our the person first language. Thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you so much, everyone. So um, are there other? Um, I don't think there are other questions, but I am. Loving what I am reading. <laughs> so, directory of all those services, uh, yes, um, we would be ha very happy to help with producing inclusive events. <laughs> Surf cap, uh, you know. So, I guess I would pass the microphone to um, Anne for the next parts of the program. Thank you so much, Ms. Jael, for having this such an informative session. Um, now, uh, guy, now everyone, to give his closing remarks, may I now call on Mr. Jefferson Cortes, Therp Caps co-founder. Hello everyone. Um, I'm having hard. I'm having a technical issue here. But anyway, um, yeah. Were you able to hear me? Am I audible? Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you everyone. Thank you, Anne. Um, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, um, uh, as I'd like to thank you to all who participated in today's webinar. Yeah, <laughs> I'm one of the sign language interpreter. Yeah, and um, for our speaker, uh, founder and CEO, Ms. Jael Cortez, for sharing all her insights. And to the organizers of this event, uh, together with her partners, a massive thank you, shout out to all of you. And it gives me uh, really joy on uh, knowing the growing number of advocates here uh, for inclusive uh, inclusion and accessibility. So uh, connect with TurpCap uh, today and together let's make our digital world more accessible for all. Thank you, Anne. Back to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jefferson Cortes. Indeed, we gained so many takeaways from this webinar. Now, if you would like to learn more about the di different digital accessibility services that TurpCap offers, you may connect with them by visiting their website, terpcapservices.com, or you may also send an email at terpcap at gmail.com. Or send an SMS or give a call at 0928-3750-097. Okay? So you can also take a screenshot of the, the uh, screen shared so that it's it'll be easier for you to contact them. Now, now it's a wrap. We are formally closing this session. Once again, this has been your host, Anta Lavera. Thank you, everyone, and may you enjoy the rest of your Tuesday afternoon. Bye, everyone!